Retro Static Radio proudly takes pleasure in bringing you a parade of outstanding thrillers, sci-fi, and horror. The most notable melodramas from stage and screen, fiction and radio, presented to bring you to the edge of your chair to keep you in... Suspense! Good evening. This is Arthur Carey, and very happy am I to be with Retrostatic Radio alongside my friends and fellow voices in today's show. Tonight's radio play was originally broadcast on November 17, 1941, written by Bernard Herrmann for the legendary Orson Welles. The first performance mented it as a classic of the medium, with Welles reprising his role time and time again. Personally, I've never met anyone who didn't like a good ghost story, but I do know that there are people who think there are people who don't like a good ghost story. For the benefit of these people, at least, I go on record at the outset of this evening's entertainment with a somber assurance that, although blood may be curdled on this program, none shall be spilled. There'll be no shooting, knifing, throttling, axing, or poisonings here. No clanking chains, no cobwebs, no bony and or hairy hands appearing from a secret panel or, better yet, bedroom curtains. If it's any part of that dear old phosphorescent foolishness that people who don't like ghost stories don't like, I assure you we haven't got it. Not tonight. What we do have tonight is a thriller. If it's half as good as we think it is, you can call it a shocker. A story doesn't always have to appeal to the heart. It can also appeal to the spine. Sometimes you want your heart warmed, and other times you want your spine to tingle. That tingling, it is to be hoped, will be quite audible as you listen tonight to The Hitchhiker. I'm in an old carport on Route 66, just west of Gallup, New Mexico. If I tell it, perhaps it'll help me. Keep me from going, going crazy. I gotta tell this quickly, I'm not crazy. I feel perfectly well, except that I'm running a slight temperature now. My name is Ronald Adams. I'm 36 years of age, unmarried, tall, dark with a mustache. I drive a 1940 Buick, license number 6Y175189. I was born in Brooklyn. All this, I know, I know that at this very moment I'm perfectly sane. That it's not me who's gone mad, but something else. Something utterly beyond my control. At any minute, though, that link may break. This may be the last thing I ever tell on Earth. Last night, I'll ever see the stars. Six days ago, I left Brooklyn to drive to California. Goodbye, son. Good luck to you, my boy. Goodbye, Mom. Here, give me a kiss and I'll get going. Wait, I'll come out to the car with you. Let me just get my coat. Mom, it's raining. Stay here at the door and keep dry. Hey, what's that? Tears? You promised me you wouldn't cry. Oh, I know, dear. I, I'm sorry. I, I just hate to see you go. Mom, I'll be back. I'll only be on the coast for a couple of months. You won't even have time to miss me. It's not that. It's just, I, I wish you weren't driving all the way there. People do it every day. I'll be fine. I know, but you'll be careful, won't you? And promise me you'll be extra careful. Don't fall asleep or drive fast or or pick up any strangers. <laughs> You'd think I was 17 again with the way you're laying it on. And don't forget to call me as soon as you get to Hollywood. Of course I will. Don't you worry about me. There isn't anything gonna happen. It's just eight days of perfect driving on smooth, decent, civilized roads with a gas station and food stop every 10 miles. I gotta go. I love you, Ma. Oh, I love you too, son. I was in fine spirits. The drive ahead of me, even the loneliness, seemed like a lark. But that was before him. Crossing the Brooklyn Bridge that morning in the rain, I saw a man leaning against the cables. He seemed to be waiting for a lift. There were spots of fresh rain on his shoulders. He was carrying a cheap overnight bag in one hand. He was thin, nondescript, with a cap pulled over his eyes. I would have forgotten him completely, except just an hour later, while crossing the Pulaski Skyway over the Jersey Flats, I saw him again. At least, he looked like the same person. He was standing now with one thumb pointing west. 
I couldn't figure out how he'd got there, but I thought probably just some fast car had picked him up, beating me to the skyway and then dropped him off. I didn't stop for him. Late that night, I swear I saw him again. It was on the Pennsylvania Turnpike between Harrisburg and Pittsburgh. It's 265 miles long with a very high speed limit. I was just slowing down for one of the tunnels when I saw him standing there. Under an arc light by the side of the road, I could see him quite distinctly. The bag, the cap, even the spots of fresh rain splattered over his shoulders. He waved and gave a hello to me this time. Hello. I stepped on the gas like a shot, leaving him waving at me in the rearview mirror. It's lonely country through the Allegheny Mountains, and I had no intention of stopping. Besides, the coincidences, or whatever it was, gave me the willies. But I had two when the low gas light came on. It took a time, but I eventually pulled off at the next gas station. You sure? Fill her up, please. Not a problem. Check your tires, too? No, thank you. Don't see a lot of these full-service stations anymore, huh? Eh. Nice night, isn't it? Yeah, uh, rained here recently, has it? Not a drop all week. Oh, oh, I, I suppose it hasn't done your business any harm, then. No, sure. People drive through here all kinds of weather. Mostly business, you know. There ain't many fancy cars out turnpike this season of the year. No, no, I suppose not. What, um, uh, what about hitchhikers? <laughs> hitchhikers? Here? What, you don't see many around here? Not really. If we did, it'd be safe for sore eyes. Oh, why's that? A guy'd be a fool to start hitching on this road. Just look at it. Then you've never seen anyone? No. Well, maybe they get lift from the turnpike starts. I mean, you know, just before the toll house. But then it'd be a mighty long ride. Most cars wouldn't want to pick up a guy for that long of a ride. And, you know, this is pretty lonesome country here. Mountains and woods. You ain't seen anybody like that around here, have you? No, 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 no. I, it was just, a uh, just curiosity. Oh, I see. Well, that'll be 43.19. Here you go. Keep the change and have a good night. Yeah, you too, sir. The events from the last day gradually passed through my mind as sheer coincidence. Bizarre, surely, but purely coincidental. I didn't think about the man all day the next day, till just outside of Zanesville, Ohio. Then I saw him again. It was a bright, sunshiny afternoon. The peaceful Ohio fields, brown with the autumn stubble, lay dreaming in the golden light. And I was driving slowly, drinking it all in, when the road suddenly ended in a detour. Just as I had seen him in front of that barrier, before I could take that turn, my car stalled out. Now, let me explain before I go on. There was nothing sinister about him. He was as drab as a mud fence, nor was his attitude menacing in any way. He merely stood there, waiting, almost drooping a little. The cheap overnight bag in his hand, he looked as though he'd been waiting there for hours. And then he looked up. He hailed me and started walking towards me. Hello. Hello. Going to California? No, 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 no. Headed, headed the other way to, to New York. Mister. Hello. After I got the car started and back on the road again, I felt like a fool. Yet the thought of picking him up, of having him sit next to me, beside me even for a moment, was somehow unbearable. At the same time I felt, now more than ever, unspeakably alone. Hour after hour went by. The fields, the town, ticking off one by one. Slowly, the sun began to set, and with the shifting light, 
I knew that I was going to see him again. And though I dreaded the sight, I caught myself searching the side of the road, waiting for him to appear on the shoulder, hand outstretched, thumb pointing west, fresh rain on a faded jacket. It was dark by the time the growl in my stomach matched the sound of the engine. I pulled off at the closest little diner, hoping for something to eat. I idled for a moment and waited, not seeing light on inside the store, but right on the edge of my headlamps. It couldn't have been. It was just a shape in the dark, perched against the side of the store. What do you want? There was a... Huh, he was just there. Oh, um, you sell sandwiches and sodas, don't you? We do in the daytime. We're closed up for the night. I, I saw that, but I was just hoping for a cup of coffee. Not at this time and I, mister. My wife's the cook and she's in bed. No, wait, mister. Don't shut the door. Please, listen. Just a minute ago. Just just a minute ago, there was a man standing here, right beside this stand. A suspicious looking man. I, I don't, I didn't mean to disturb you. You see, I was driving along and I just happened to look and there he was. What was he doing? Well, nothing, but... It's late. I'm tired. Now go on your way. But, sir... Now get before I call Sheriff Oaks. I got into the car again and drove on slowly. I was beginning to hate the car. If I could have found the place to stop, to rest even just a little, then maybe... Maybe it would all become nonsensical boredom, my imagination trying to make the dull droning of the road more dramatic. I was in the Ozark Mountains of Missouri now. The few resort places there were closed. Only an occasional log cabin, seemingly deserted. That's all that broke the monotony of the wild, wooded landscape. But I had seen him at that roadside stand. I know it. I knew that I'd be seeing him again. Maybe at the next turn of the road, maybe at the next fork, who knows. But I knew that when I saw him next, I only had one option. I would run him down. But I didn't see him again that night, nor for the better part of the next day. I stopped the car at a sleepy little junction just across the border into Oklahoma to let a train pass. When he appeared, across the tracks, leaning against the telephone pole, it was a perfectly airless, dry day. The red clay of Oklahoma was baking under the southwestern sun, yet there, on his shoulders, were spots of fresh rain. I couldn't stand that. Without thinking, blindly, I put my foot on the gas. He didn't even look up at me. The mad beast under the hood roared at him, but nothing. He was staring at the ground. I stepped on the gas hard, slamming down the shifter, and aimed the car towards him. I could hear the train in the distance now. But I didn't care. I gunned it and... Something went wrong. The car stalled out on the tracks. The train was coming closer. I could hear its bell ringing and the cry of its whistle. Yet still he stood. Now I knew that he was beckoning. Beckoning me to my death louder than the train whistle ever could. I must have frustrated him that time. The starter worked at last. I managed to back up out of harm's way. When the train passed, though, he was gone. I was again all alone in this hot, dry afternoon. But for how long? After that, I knew I had to do something. I didn't know who this man was or what he wanted of me. I only knew that from now on, I mustn't let myself be alone for another moment. Alone, all I could do was picture that man waiting, beckoning for a ride. Like there, on the side of the road. But no, that wasn't him. It was a woman with her thumb outstretched. Anyone is better than no one. If it hadn't been for that woman hitching on her own, I don't know what I would have done. Hey, uh, need a lift? You bet. Thanks, mister. How far are you going? Oh, uh, well, where are you heading? Amarillo, Texas. I'll drive you there. Gee, thanks again, mister. Say, mind if I take off my shoes? My dogs are killing me. Oh, uh, yeah, go right ahead. Oh, that feels great. It's hard to get a break. Hitchhike much? Sure. Only it's tough sometimes in these great open spaces to get picked up. Yeah, I should think it would be. 
Though I'd bet if you got a good pickup in a fast car, you could get places faster than, say, another person in another car, couldn't you? I don't follow you. Well, take me, for instance. Suppose I'm, I'm driving across the country, say, at a nice steady clip, about 45 miles an hour. Couldn't, couldn't a girl like you, just standing beside the road waiting for a lift, beat me to town, or any town, really, provided she's gotten picked up every time in a car doing from 65 to 70 miles an hour? I don't know. What difference does it make? Oh, no, no difference. I, just a crazy idea I had while sitting here in this car, you know, for a while. <laughs> Imagine. Spending your time in a swell car like this, thinking of things like that. Why is that? What would you do instead? What would I do? <laughs> if I was a good-looking fellow like yourself? Why, I'd just enjoy myself every minute of the time. I'd sit back and, and relax. And if I saw a good-looking girl along the side of the road... <gasps> hey, look out! Did you see him? See who? That man, standing there besides a the barbed wire fence. <laughs> I... I didn't see anybody. I, it was nothing but a bunch of cows and the wire fence. No. What did you think he was doing? Trying to run into the barbed wire fence? The, there was a man there, I tell you. A, a thin gray man with an overnight bag in his hand. And I was, I was trying to, to run him down. Run him down? You mean kill him? You say you didn't see him back there? You sure? I didn't see a soul. Watch for him the next time. Keep watching. Keep your eyes peeled on the road. He'll turn up again. Maybe any minute now. There, look! <gasps> what is wrong with you? Wait, wait. Did, did you see him? No! I didn't see him that time. And personally, mister, I don't expect never to see him. All I want to do is go on living. I don't see how I will very long driving with you. I don't know what came over me. Please, please don't go. Damn it. Where's my other shoe? Please. I'm going to California. I can take you all the way to California with me. Seeing pink elephants all the way? No way. Thanks just the same. Ah, uh, here. Hey! No, you, you can't go. I, I, I need you. Please don't. What you need is a good dose of sleep, mister. And give me back my shoe. She ran from me, hit me, as though as though I were a monster. A few minutes later, I saw her in the passenger seat of a semi-truck. She didn't look over to me. I knew then that I was utterly alone. I was in the heart of the great Texas prairie. There wasn't a car on the road after the truck went by. I was trying to figure out what to do, how to get a hold of myself. If I could find a place to rest, or even if I could take a nap right here in this car for just a couple hours along the side of the road. I was getting my winter overcoat out of the back seat to use as a blanket when, no, I saw him again, coming towards me, emerging from the herd of moving steer. Maybe I should have spoken to him then, fought it out then and there, instead of running away. For now, he began to be everywhere. Wherever I stopped, even for a moment, for gas, for oil, for a drink of pop, a cup of coffee, a sandwich, he was there. I saw him standing outside the auto camp in Amarillo that night, when I dared to slow down. He was sitting near a drinking fountain of a little camping spot just inside the border of New Mexico. He was waiting for me outside the Navajo reservation when I stopped to check my tires. I saw him in Albuquerque when I bought a couple gallons of gas. I was afraid to stop now. I began to drive faster and faster. I was in, in a lunar landscape now, the great arid mesa country of New Mexico. I drove through it with the indifference of a fly crawling over the face of the moon. Now he didn't even wait for me to stop. Unless I drove at 85 miles an hour over these endless roads, he waited for me at every other mile. I'd see his figure shadowless, flitting before me, still in its same attitude, over the cold, lifeless ground, flitting over dried-up rivers, over broken stones cast up by the old glacial upheavals, flitted in the pure, cloudless air. I was beside myself when I finally reached Gallup, New Mexico. There's an auto camp here, cold, almost deserted. Outside the auto office, a phone booth stood, the jaundiced yellow light blinking within. 
I had the feeling that if only I could speak to someone familiar, someone loved, I could finally pull myself together. Your call, please. I'd like, I'd like to place a call to my home in Brooklyn, New York. I'm Ronald Adams. The number is Beechwood 20828. One moment, please. Please deposit $3.85 for the first three minutes. Yes, of course. I once read somewhere that love could banish a demon. It was only dusk. I knew Mother'd be home and awake. I pictured her tall and white-haired, in her crisp house dress, going about her tasks. It'd be enough, I thought, just to hear the even calmness of her voice. That could right my mind. Ready for Brooklyn. Go ahead. Hello? Mrs. Adams' residence. Hello, Mother? This is Mrs. Adams' residence. Who is it you wish to speak to, please? What the... Who's this? This is Mrs. Winnie. Mrs. Winnie? I don't know any Mrs. Winnie. Is this Beechwood 20828? Yes, it is. Where's Mother? Where's Mrs. Adams? Mrs. Adams is not at home. She's still in the hospital. The hospital? Yes. Who is this calling, please? Is it a member of the family? The the hospital? W- w- what's she in the hospital for? She's been prostrated for five days. Nervous breakdown. But who is this calling? Nervous breakdown? My mother would never... It's all taken place since the death of her son, Ronald. Death of her... De- death of her oldest son? Ronald? Hey, what is this all about? What number is this? This is Beechwood 20828. It was all very sudden. He was killed just six days ago in an automobile accident on the Brooklyn Bridge. Your three minutes are up, sir. Your three minutes are up, sir. Your three minutes are up, sir. Your three minutes are up. So I'm sitting here in this deserted auto camp in Gallup, New Mexico. I'm trying to think, trying to get a hold of myself. Otherwise, I'm, I'm going to go crazy. Outside, it's night. The vast, soundless night of New Mexico. A million stars are in the sky. Ahead of me stretched a thousand miles of empty mesa. Mountains, prairies, desert. Somewhere among them, he's waiting for me. Somewhere I shall know who he is and who I am. Hello. Hello. So ends the first of the rejuvenated radio series, Suspense with The Hitchhiker, starring A.J. Carey as Ronald Adams. Next week... Retrostatic Radio revisits Duffy's Tavern, with Archie the manager cutting prices to fight inflation. To become a donor, producer, or sponsor for any of the broadcasts for Retrostatic Radio, please visit our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash retrostatic radio, or email us at retrostaticradio at gmail.com. We are also on all major social media outlets. This concludes our broadcast day.